I know what you're all thinking. Like, Wait a minute. The body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Isn't that what you preached on last time? Yes. And I'm going to do it again. It's going to be better. <laughs> you're going to like it. I've been practicing for two months. Just wait till you hear it the third time. It'll be even better. Just kidding. No, I'm not going to preach the same sermon again. So simmer down. But actually, I, I did want to follow up on this, on this sermon, on this idea, and offer a, offer a, essentially a, a, a follow-up sermon, a sequel, if you will. I know you've all been at the edge of your seats waiting. What is, how is he going to follow this up? Yeah, Kevin back there is ready to go. But so this is something that I, I, I really wanted to, to follow back up on. But to do that, first I want to recap what we, what we talked about in the last sermon. So the, we are the body of Christ, that God has uniquely created us all with unique gifts and talents and passions and proclivities and different experiences and backgrounds. And he's gifted us differently and called us differently to be members of his body, to invest in his kingdom, to be different, play different roles in the church, that whether it be up here singing, and you don't want me up here singing, so that he's called us differently, whether it be back in the sound booth, you know, it's good for some of us to not be back there, or in the children's worship, or whether it be greeting, ushering, if that's a, if that's a word, whatever that, whatever that looks like, or if it's outside of, I talked last time about, you know, even outside of our Sunday gatherings, if it be a, a small group, or just inviting young people into your home or out for coffee or a young family or whoever that could be, but looking for how God has gifted you and how he could use you in the church as part of the kingdom, that we're not called to just merely be beneficiaries of the church, but to actually be invested in the church as part of Christ's body. So that's essentially what we talked about last time. And so I wanted to follow that up today with really how do we take that concept and take our faith and, and extend that beyond the walls of the church and live a missional life on mission that wherever we go into the workplace, into the marketplace, that our faith is not just about our GPS location, on Sunday mornings from 9.30 to 11. And I'm glad that we're all here and that's fantastic. We could show up every Sunday. We could be involved as a, as a greeter, as an usher. We could help out. We could even put money in the tray. But our, our faith is about our lifestyle. It's not about a once a week occurrence, but really about living out our faith in the community, in the workplace, in the marketplace, wherever we find ourselves. So that's what we're going to explore today. And a lot of times when we think about this idea, this concept of God creating us uniquely, gifting us uniquely and calling us, we think just in terms of talents and, again, gifts, passions, those kinds of things, that he's, skills that he's given us. But sometimes we don't think about where he's actually placed us. And I, it's funny, I didn't actually, I didn't know that... Um, that Jack was going to be reading from James, uh, the first chapter, 2 through 5, because I plan on briefly mentioning James 1.1. 1, 1. So there you go. And in James, it's interesting that he opens his letter with this note of who he's writing to, that he's writing to the 12 tribes that have been dispersed. And that for us, 2,000 years later, it can seem like, oh, it's, that's nice that he just kind of gives us that little information. But you think about the people he's writing to don't need that, that. They don't need to remember that. They know who they are. They know that they've been dispersed. But you, if you put yourself in the mind of a good first century Jew, what, what does that elicit in your emotions? That, this, that was a very difficult and painful thing that they had been dispersed. You think about what that land represented. This was God's promise to them. This was God's promise to Abram that he would make them in Genesis chapter 12. He would make him into a great name, into a great nation. His promise to Moses that he would deliver them from exile, from slavery into this promised land and that they would no longer be under this, this pagan rule in, in Egypt. And so the land for God's people was not just their comfort, was not just their home, where they preferred to live. This was God's promise to them. This was God's faithfulness to them. This was their identity as the people of God, and that God had allowed them to be conquered 
and Habakkuk struggled. God, how could you use more pain, more evil Babylon to punish less evil Israel? And that God allowed them to be dispersed throughout the ancient Near Eastern world. And how that seemed and felt to them like, God, you've forgotten your people. You've broken your promises. How could you allow this to be? And so in the, in the first century, for James to open up this letter with this emotional, emotionally charged reminder of God's people have been dispersed from the land that he's promised them. And then I, I wasn't going to go beyond verse 1, but thank you, Jack, for pointing out that he, after eliciting this emotional response, he goes on to say, in this difficulty, that when you encounter various trials and difficulties, that you know God has a purpose and a plan and consider it a joy because he has, he's working and moving as a capability. of. It's hard for me to stop here because I, I get excited about James. You know that. So I, it's, it's hard for me to stop there, verse 1. But all that to say is it's, it's easy for us to forget that sometimes it's not just what God has called us to or in the sense of, of gifting. Sometimes it's where he's placed us. And sometimes we find ourselves far from what seems like his will, far from what seems like his promises. We find ourselves in a dark place, whether it be where we work, whether it be in our families, in our communities, whatever that looks like for you. God, where are you at? What are you doing? How could you use this and work in and, and through this? But did you ever stop to think, maybe God placed you in that dark place so that you could bring his light? So to think in terms of where God has placed us, and that for them was a very, very difficult, painful thing to think about. So I want to start there this morning. <clears throat> All right, and then from there, Paul tells the church in Colossians, chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, that whatever they do, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive reward of the inheritance it is the Lord Christ who you serve. And I know that it's natural to want to say, but you don't know my boss, but you don't know my workplace. You don't know the environment that I'm in, or you don't know whatever that is. But again, to think of, did, could God have placed you in that place to be an influence, to be his light, to be the one that is different, that is unique, that that is different in how they speak and how they treat people and how they work, that ultimately... Wherever we are, whether we're in the workplace, whether we're stay-at-home parent, whether we're retired, you don't get out of, get out of this by, uh, by, by no longer being or not being in the workforce. But if you're in school as a student, but wherever we are, that when we, whatever we do, whatever we put our hands to, that we do it as unto the Lord. That we're responsible to God for what we do over and above our responsibility to, to men to our boss and say, well, but everyone else in the workplace does this or but my, but my boss doesn't care if I cut corners or if I'm dishonest or whatever that could be. You know, we don't look to them as the examples to follow. We look to Jesus as our example to follow. And as I, work, I have to constantly remind my kids, we don't, we, we don't, uh, other people's poor choices don't, don't uh, excuse our poor choices, that we don't set those as the example to contrast ours or compare ours to, but we look to the positive examples of what we need to be and what we need to be doing. <clears throat> We've looked before at the Great Commission in Matthew's Gospel, and it's significant that he ends his Gospel with this command that Jesus gives to the disciples to go and while going out to make disciples of all nations. And it, the, the actual, the word go is not the actual command. Make disciples is the command. Go is actually is a participle, which can be taken different ways. Here it seems to be essentially communicating the idea while going out, that you are going about your daily life, you are going out while going out, 
make disciples. This isn't just something for those called to be in vocational ministry. This isn't just something for Pastor Gary, for Pastor Susan, for, for Pastor Josh. This isn't just something for, who you know, we get out of that because we're not, we're not vocational missionaries or pastors. This is for all of us that God has called us that whatever we do, that we do for Him, that wherever we go, go out and about to our workplaces, as we go out and about to the communities, to the marketplace, wherever we go, we are to be living lives that reflect the gospel, that reflect Jesus, that point people to him. It's not just about who we are and what we do on Sunday mornings. That, you know, we don't check our faith at the door when we leave on Sunday morning and then pick it back up when we come back next week. But who are we Monday through Saturday? Who are you in your home? Who are you in your workplace? Are you taking that with you? Does that make a difference? Are the people in your communities, are the people in your workplace, are they better off having you there? Are the people in your neighborhood impacted by the light that's in you? Or are they just the same as if you weren't a Christ follower? So the, the, the concept of how we are at work is, is, is a challenging one because it, be, it can be tempting to fall into the, the gossip, to fall into the water cooler conversations and the negativity of you know, the complaining or, again, gossiping or whatever that looks like. But to, to be the one to say, you know what, I'm not going to participate in that or jump in that, but I'm going to see myself as being the one who is going to reflect, reflect God in that, in that workplace. And I think I skipped over Matthew 5, 14 through 16, but you probably saw on the slides that God has called us to be the light of the world. And it reads, Jesus speaking to his disciples, You are the light of the world. A city, set, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Are you bringing that light with you everywhere you go? <coughs> It's interesting to look at the Apostle Paul. We tend to, to think of him as the, the author who writes so much of the New Testament, who is encouraging and teaching. He's a missionary, and he's going out and sharing the gospel to build up churches and to plant churches. We think of Paul the speaker, Paul the preacher, the apologist who it's part of his daily part of his routine to go out and actually share logically and rationally who Jesus is and what he's done. And he's actually debating and arguing and presenting in public forums with the educated of the day, the philosophers. This is part of his routine that we see in Acts. Acts 17 is a great example of this. But there's also some, another aspect of Paul that a lot of times we take for granted that there's also Paul, the tent maker, that he's bivocational. That, and, and it's interesting to ask the question, to consider, what is Paul like as the tent maker? Who is Paul the tent maker? What is he like as a business owner, as an entrepreneur? What is he like as a, as a salesman? How does he interact with his customers? How does Paul interact with his business clients, with his business partners? And, to, and we don't have very much evidence of, of that. It's speculative, but I think what we can do is see who Paul is, that everywhere he finds himself, in prison, shipwrecked, that everywhere he finds himself, he is a light, that he's living out his his faith, despite how much his life is contrasting the darkness around him, that he is living that out, that he's living a life on mission for Christ. And to see, are we, are we doing the same thing? Or are we seeing our faith as, again, our 
where we're at on Sunday mornings? Or are you coming to this buffet every Sunday morning to eat your spiritual nutrition and then going the, the rest of the week on famine? Is this where you're coming to? Is this where you read the Bible? Is this where you get your prayer? Is this where you get your worship? If you are not filling your cup, if you are not eating your, your spiritual nutrition throughout the week, how are you going to bring it into the workplace? How are you going to shine your light if you hide it whole week long, if you don't nurture it yourself? How are you going to make disciples if you're not one first yourself? And so this morning, I want to challenge you to live out on mission, to live out your faith in Christ, in your daily life, wherever you find yourself. To not keep that here, to not see that as the pastor's job. It's a good thing we have other people that, that can go represent Jesus. And sometimes we find we, it might be natural to pray for God, bring a light to this dark place. I change the people in my, in my workplace, but not see that, wait a minute, maybe I'm the one that God has called to do that. God has uniquely created us and gifted us and uniquely placed us to be, able, to be his light, to be his ambassador. I love this morning I was reading in my personal devotionals. I, wasn't, I, I already had my sermon ready, but I was reading in, in Ephesians, and Paul refers to himself as, the, as Christ's ambassador in chains. And I just love that. There's no stopping Paul from living out his faith, from shining this light. And it doesn't mean that he's perfect. It doesn't mean that we're perfect to everywhere we go. But it's directing people to the one who is. It's not our light. It's the light that's within us that we are sharing and shining. So the question I'll leave you with today, the exhortation is, how can you live that out in an effective way? St. Francis of Assisi said, Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. And I love that. And for those of you who know me, know that I'm passionate about apologetics, about sharing our faith in a rational, logical way. And a bit, the most effective apologetic you'll ever have, and that is sharing of your faith, the most effective evidence you'll have of the gospel is a changed life, is living that out. How you treat people, how you talk to people, that lifestyle is more impactful than any words you could put together, any argument you could have, as rational as it may be. Live out a life that reflects the truth of that which we believe.